and then I will make a, a very short introduction and, okay. and then Zhao on you, my friend. All right. And then I will make a, a very short. Oh, okay, it's working. <laughs> um, so um, good afternoon, guys. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you guys here. And today it's well. Today is a fantastic day. I have my good friend Justin Ikyo, uh in this seminar series. So first of all, thank you so much, Justin, for finding a time to, to, to give this talk to us. Uh, I met uh, Justin uh, a decade or so ago in UC California, uh, Santa Cruz. Um, he was a PhD student at the time that was interested in broad questions that combines um, ecology, uh, network science, um, anthropology, and and this, and he was always very curious about and excited about how to study ecological systems with uh, dynamical approaches to the problem that that were borrowed from physics, but also combine a lot of biology and a lot of. Uh, unexpected twists that involves uh, historical information from Savo lions to the uh, extinction in the ancient Egypt. Uh, it was a real pleasure to read and to participate in some of his work. And I hope that we can continue to collaborate in the future. So after, uh, so he, he went to Kent State University as an undergrad. So he did the, the PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Then he, he moved as a postdoc to Simon Fraser uh, University and also work at Santa Fe Institute. And now he's a professor at UC Merced. So thank you so much, Justin. And well, the, the Zoom room is all yours. And whenever you, can, you start, please be my guest. Great, thank you, Paolo, and thanks everyone for for having me. And it's it's really fun to see uh, so many familiar faces. And um, yeah, and 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 go ahead, feel free to to stop me um, during the talk if you have questions or anything. Um, but I just wanted to share some of the recent stuff that we've been doing, um, looking at how the dynamics of starvation recovery can bro provide insight into macroecological or macroevolutionary patterns like Cope's rule. Um, as well as how uh, constraints of predation might shed some light on how uh, specifically mammalian systems are, are, are structured. Um, <clears throat> oops, how do I go forward here? Let's see, oh, there we go. Uh, so if we start really simply, uh, we can start <laughs> with something that everybody intuitively understands. Uh, and that is that, that all organisms must find food, acquire food and, and process food. Uh, and they, they do so in different ways, depending on the organism. So we have sauropods, perhaps they were consuming uh, more homogeneously distributed, evenly distributed foods that were of lower quality, easy to find. Uh, we can think of uh, primates, monkeys, uh, going after fruit resources that are clustered across the landscape. So they're a little more difficult to find, but much higher quality. Uh, all the way up to carnivores, consuming foods that are very, very clustered and very, very high nutritional quality. Um, but also don't want to be eaten. So they have to find those foods and then acquire them uh, and process them. And so they have to deal with environments, uh, resource environments that present different challenges from homogeneity uh, to patchy, uh, somewhat patchy to, to very patchy. And this uh, levies onto the system different types of risks. Uh, and risk is part of the game. And according to Captain James T. Kirk, risk is part of the game if you want to sit in that chair, which is appropriate given that uh, James T. Kirk just blasted into space this morning and, and came down. Uh, I think he came down. I'm not sure if he came down. Um, I, I, I did see he went up. Uh, but we can partition risk into different categories. We can think about risk that, that their resources convey to the organism. So in, in terms of starvation, if you don't find enough food, uh, you starve, that's a particular risk. And that has to do with the availability of resources throughout the environment. 
how patchily those distributed those resources are distributed. Some of this is intrinsic to the resource itself, and some of it has to do with interactions with other organisms because competitors can make resources more difficult to find. Uh, as well as the energy density uh, of, of foods, how how what high are the quality of those foods? We can also think of predation risks, uh, and 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 those vary with the landscape, right? More open environments have different predative risks than uh, closed canopy systems. It also varies with the behaviors of the organisms. Organisms tend not to want to be eaten, so they have behaviors to mitigate predation risks. And I would make the argument that a lot of this, uh, at least a first, first approximation, uh, varies as a function of body size. Uh, many of these risks uh, are allometric and change with body size. This is really nicely shown in, in one of my favorite papers, uh, The Patterns of Predation in a Diverse Predator-Prey System uh, by Tony Sinclair et al. and Nature, I think in 2003, uh, where they're showing the percent of mortality due to predation on the y-axis here. And uh, log herbivore weight on the x-axis. And so these different points represent different herbivore species where the letter denotes the different species. So W is wildebeest, Z is zebra, B is buffalo, G is giraffe, R is rhinoceros, H is hippo, E is elephant. And what we can see is that there's this really sharp threshold in terms of how pre predators uh, impact these herbivore systems. Um, if you're below the threshold, you're, you're basically doomed to die in the claws of a predator. Uh, almost all of the mortality of smaller herbivores is due to predation by, by other predator species. But if you get above this threshold, uh, if we look at zebra and then buffalo, and really when we get up to giraffe sized or rhinoceros sized, you effectively escape predation. And that escape from predation is around 812, 800 to 1200 uh, kilograms for, for the herbivore species. So we know that body size structures interactions, but we also know that interactions influences body size. And we see this when we look over evolutionary timescales. Um, so one of the most famous observations of this is Cope's rule or the macroevolutionary trend towards larger body sizes within clades. And we can see this uh, looking at John Alroy's 98 paper, which is another one of my favorites. Uh, and this is on, let's see, can I get the, cur can you see my cursor now? Yeah, okay, so if we're looking at this figure, um, time is in millions of years on the x-axis and body mass in grams is on the y-axis. So we have the asteroid uh, dooming the non-avian dinosaurs at around this point. And very quickly thereafter, uh, mammals obtain these large body size. So they fill in this large body size niche. Uh, we can see this looking at just the maximum sizes of organisms of mammals on different continents as well. Immediately after the, the, the KPG extinction, uh, we have this, this filling in of these large body size niches. Another thing Alroy did that was really interesting was he looked at the change in mass within this data set, this is North American mammals, change in mass as a function of the mass of the older species, and this is in log grams. So I've, I've moved, I, I've, I've twisted this uh, figure so it's a little weird to read because we have a positive change in mass on the left and a negative change in mass on the right. But what this means essentially is if we're above this point, uh, there's a positive change in mass within the clade, so, the, so the, the clade is growing in body size up to this black point. And above this black point, um, at this size threshold, we have a negative change in mass. So this is essentially is serving as a hypothetical or theoretical um, evolutionary attractor, pulling organismal clades in terms of body size up to this point or driving them down if they get above this point. And just to give you a sense of the sizes, uh, on the bottom, I'm picturing the modern African elephant as well, next to the dinotheres from the Miocene and then Dricotheres in the Oligocene. So they got, they got pretty big, about two and a half times that, uh, the size of modern elephants. Not as big as sauropods, but um, we can't all be dinosaurs. Uh, so, so today I really want to address three uh, principal questions. Um, the first is, what is the influence of starvation recovery on the dynamics of populations? And can it provide insight into processes driving body size evolution, like I showed on the previous slide? Uh, second, how can different sources of mortality provide insight into the constraints of predation? And third, and we'll see if we get here, this is maybe ambitious, uh, how do individuals balance starvation risk against reproductive investment when resource acquisition is uncertain? And what are the evolutionary consequences of this? So, Starting with the first question, uh, let's start with something very simple that most of us have seen, and this is the Latka-Volterra consumption model or predation model. 
And here we have a uh, two uh, dimensional dynamic system where we have uh, an equation describing how resource consumer biomass changes over over time and an equation describing how resource biomass changes over time. Uh, very simply, resources grow until they reach some carrying capacity in the absence of a consumer, but in the presence of consumer, they also suffer uh, consumer oriented mortality. Uh, consumers grow uh, by eating the resources and then have some natural mortality. So in this sense, we, we really have the effect of starvation or running out of resources for the consumer implicitly built into the system. As resources run out, uh, that means R becomes lower and lower and lower, uh, the growth of the consumer is, is, is diminished, right? So, so starvation is in here, but it's implicit. But we can also imagine a model where we incorporate starvation explicitly. And here we need a, a state structured model. We're calling this the nutritional state structured model where the consumer uh, population is divided into two states, one a full state and one a hungry state. Now the full state we can assume has all of its mass. The individual has all of its mass. And in the hungry state, it's lost some mass because it's burning its fat mass for energy. We can approximate how much mass is it, mass it's burning by just saying that when it's in a hungry state, it's burnt all of its fat mass. In reality, that would mean the organism would probably be dead. Uh, but at first approximation, this is probably a good, a good place to start. And then we can also say that when the organism has metabolized all of its fat mass and all of its muscle mass, because when you run out of fat, you start metabolizing your muscle, uh, we can say that it's, it's dead. Um, and so this gives us a sense of how an organism kind of switches between different mass categories as a function of its interaction with its resources. We can put these states on an ontogenetic growth curve, and this will allow us to derive the time scales over which these processes happen. So the ontogenetic growth curve is uh, shaped like this. It's generally sigmoidal in shape. Uh, we're using the universal ontogenetic growth curve um, proposed by Jeffrey West in 2001, where the organism starts at a certain mass. So this is the mass of an organism and grows over its lifetime to reach uh, this asymptotic mass. We can derive the time scale, the time that it takes to do that. Well, if we derive the time that it takes to reach its asymptotic mass, it would be infinity. So we'll just say for, for sake of argument, when it reaches 95% of the asymptotic mass, that's where we assume it's reached its reproductive complete uh, body size. So, and we say the proportion of its, on, of its asymptotic mass where it reaches um, this, this uh, maximum body size is given by this epsilon sub lambda. Okay, so that's the proportion of its maximum size that it reaches just through growth. But then we have to think about the processes of starvation and recovery. So the process of losing all of your fat, the process of building back your fat stores, and then the process of losing all of your fat and all of your muscle mass if you, if you die. And we can write these proportions of the maximum uh, body mass for that individual as a function of these allometric relationships. And these allometric relationships tell us how much fat mass an organism of a given mass carries. And interestingly, the, the fat mass allometric relationship is super linear, which means that uh, larger organisms carry more mass than you'd expect um, from, a, from a linear relationship or a sublinear relationship. Uh, and we can also define the, the point on this ontogenetic growth curve where you run out of fat mass and your muscle mass. So defining these points allow us to calculate the time scales that are required um, that, they, that these starvation recovery and, and mortality processes take along this ontogenetic, ontogenetic growth curve. So from all of this, we can derive time scales for these processes as a function of the consumer mass. So we can imagine consumers across a range of body size and what the starvation time scale should be, uh, or in, in this case, this is the rate. So what's the starvation rate for that organism of a given size, what's the mortality due to starvation, what's the recovery, and what's the consumer growth rate uh, for organisms of different sizes. And one interesting thing that we can point out or we observe when looking at this is that there's these strange asymptotes that appear at really large body sizes. And these are somewhat aphysical and abiological, but they're kind of fun to think about. So this really, uh, th this, this asymptotic mass for starvation at really large body sizes above 10 to the eighth uh, what does this mean? This is essentially when uh, the body, when the organismal body is 100% fat, okay? Um, so this means that starvation time is infinitely long, which is why the asymptote is there. And we can actually solve for this mass by setting this 
allometric um, equation for fat mass equal to one. Uh, when we do that and solve for the mass, we get uh, a mass size of about 8.3 times 10 to the eighth grams. So this is an organism that's about the size of 140 African elephants. So if we imagine these allometric relationships consistent across mammals of increasing body size, at some point, because fat mass is super linear relative to body size, the organism just becomes a blob of fat. And that occurs at 140 African elephants. But you can imagine, you know, when we go into marine systems, we're starting to approach these types of boundaries because a whale is kind of like a blob of fat. Um, there's some other stuff in there, but it's a lot fat, you know. Um, so this is actually, so 140 African elephants is about five times the largest blue whale, which is a very large organism, and uh, this is why we don't see them. So Asymptotes are, by definition, unrealistic boundaries, um, and body size evolution requires a within lineage selective and mechanistic driver. So can we use this model, um, this perspective of the world, uh, to get insight into this mechanistic driver of larger body size? So what we do then is we take these allometric rates and combine them with a model that includes starvation explicitly. So on the top, I'm showing just the traditional Lotka Volterra model where reproduction is proportional to the resource density. Uh, in the nutritional state structured model, we have two states for the um, consumer population. Now, the rate at which it is moving from the full to the hungry state is driven by running out of resources. So as you run out of resources, you starve and you move from the full to the hungry state. Uh, as you gain more entry resources, you move from the hungry to the full state. You recover because you run into more food. Now, one important difference between this model and the LV model is that when you're in a full state, we assume you're healthy, you're energetically replete, and so you reprodu reproduce at a constant rate. So reproduction here is an on-off switch. Uh, if you're full, you're reproducing, and if you're hungry, you have other problems, uh, and so you're not, you're not reproducing in that state. And once you move to the hungry state, it's also possible that you die. Um, and then, so that's really the, the, the difference between the two models. I'm not gonna go into the, the details of this model, but I just wanna show, um, it's a, show you that it's a three-dimensional um, differential equation or differential equation system where we have changes in the full state, changes in the hungry state and changes in the resource. And um, we have growth, recovery, starvation, mortality, as well as maintenance, because when an organism exists, it requires energy from resources just to maintain its, its own state. Um, and those are the, the things that go into the model. Okay, so what happens? Can we derive any insight when we combine uh, these allometric rates for these different processes with the dynamic system that we, that we set up? Um, can we predict anything? Uh, one thing we wanted to see if we could predict is the, the density, the steady state density of organisms as a function of body size, which is known as Damoth's rule. So here we're showing our um, steady state derivation uh, for the model. Uh, we get a steady state for the, for the full consumer and steady state for the hungry consumer in green and orange respectively. Uh, and I'm showing that against uh, data uh, these are measured steady states or measured densities for mammals across a range of body masses. And they follow a very specific scaling. Um, the regression of the data points is shown as a, as a black uh, uh, stippled line or dashed line. And what we see is that the model does really, really good at predicting um, both the intercept and the slope of what is known as Damas law. Uh, the slope is purely a function of the dynamics in the rate equations that we've included, and I'm just showing the equation down there, uh, not that it's really meaningful, just kind of looking at it like that. Um, and the other, actually, the other point, ignore the other point, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, because that's actually out of date. <laughs> so, um, and we get two steady states, actually, from the model, because we have one for full and hungry, but one thing to note is that the, the hungry state, steady state, is uh, about two orders of magnitude lower than the full um, state densities. Uh, so if we added those together to get, the, to get the entire consumer density, it wouldn't really be different than the uh, green line. So the green line is also standing in for the, for the uh, full steady state, um, steady state densities. 
Okay, so we're able to predict uh, Damas law pretty well with these rate equations and, and dynamic um, expectations. Um, but can it provide any insight into Cope's rule? So we wanted to examine the competitive advantages of body sizes among closely related species. So we essentially set up a competition uh, between organisms that vary very little in, uh, in body fat, okay? And we wanted to see who wins. So in other words, if we take a consumer of some mass and then let it compete against another consumer of mass prime, where it's tweaked a little bit in terms of how much fat it carries, uh, which consumer wins? And we measure who wins by who pushes their resources to a lower steady state. And this is classic R star theory. Um, if you have two competing consumers, whoever pushes the consumer to a lower steady state uh, will outcompete the other. Um, and so here we have the resident consumer of mass M and below a con competitor of mass M prime. And we tweak the fat of the, of the competitor consumer uh, with this parameter chi. When chi is equal to zero, it has the same mass of its competitor. When it's, when it's a little fat, sorry, when chi is larger than zero, the competitor is a little fatter. And when chi is uh, less than zero, it's, the competitor is a little leaner. It can only be lean up to a certain point, which is the starvation threshold, because you have to have some fat. Okay, so here are the competition results from our head-to-head uh, -head competition between the competitors, between the resident and their competitors. So on the x-axis, we have the resident body mass of the organism. And on the y-axis, we have chi. So this is the modification of the consumer. When chi is equal to zero, the competitor has the, the same mass as the resident. Um, if chi is greater than zero, then we have a competitor that's fatter. And when chi is less than zero, we have a competitor that's leaner. Oops. Um, oops. And we observe for resident body masses up to a certain point, it's always the fatter competitor that wins. Okay, and that's what this blue region means. The blue region is showing who is winning. Um, so, in so below this point for the size of the resident consumer, uh, it's, it's the fatter competitor that wins. Above this point, the leaner competitor wins, okay? In other words, we can imagine this point as an attractor in body mass space, where if you're below this point, you're being pushed up because it's, if, if your competitor is slightly larger, uh, you have a competitive advantage. But above this point, um, it's the leaner competitor that has a competitive advantage. Uh, so what point is that at? When we look at the value of the optimum mass that is serving as, a, as an attractor, uh, the predicted mass is about 1.748 times 10 to the 7 grams. Uh, this is kind of exciting for us because when we look at the observed uh, masses for uh, these large mammals from the fossil record, there's two estimates. Uh, for one for Andricotherium is at 1.5 times 10 to the seventh grams. And one more recent one for Dinotherium is 1.74 times 10 to the seventh grams. Uh, and this was like close enough that I was very concerned for a long time that th there was some loop in the model and it was grabbing this value. And, but uh, it, it wasn't. <laughs> I did double, I did like check like five or six times. Um, so Coming back to these original observations by Alroy, uh, we think we've um, at least found a possible uh, mechanistic selective driver for Cope's rule, um, which is essentially replicating this attractor idea that Alroy laid out in 98, but, but here we're putting some mechanism behind it to try to explain it. Now, Alroy also predicts this lower mass threshold, but um, that we don't see in our model, but the nutritional state structured model is pretty minimal. We don't have a whole lot in it. Uh, we don't have higher trophic effects. We don't have uh, patchiness. There's a lot we don't have in the model. Um, and, and so we don't see that lower bound, but that's kind of an open question that we have. Okay, so moving along, um, the second question is how can different sources of mortality provide insight into the constraints of predation? Now, this is still really building off of the model that I just described. Um, before, we only considered starvation mortality uh, for the consumer, but of course, there's lots of different sources of mortality uh, that consumers have to deal with. 
uh, we can partition them into a couple of different categories. Uh, one might be life history mortality, and this incorporates both this idea of cohort mortality, the initial mortality rate when a cohort is born. Uh, it accounts for the actuarial mortality rate, how mortality is um, uh, accumulates over the lifetime of the organism from natural causes. Uh, we can think about mortality due to predation, if there's a predator population going after this consumer population. Uh, and we can also think about mortality uh, as, as harvesting. So if, there's a, if there is a um, consumer population out there or a, uh, a predator population out there that's subsidized by other resources, and um, so its dynamics aren't uh, innately tied to the population that it's harvesting from, uh, that might have an interesting effect on the herbivores. And of course, the, the goal of this is to go after questions regarding the, the influence of humans in, in the Pleistocene. Um, so just to give you a sense of why, why we're thinking about harvesting in this way. Okay, so I wanna show you some really simple or, or kind of initial results. Um, this is stuff, by the way, is all very much in progress, but some initial results um, just looking at these different sources of mortality. So I want to focus first on, on life history and then harvesting, and then uh, talk about predation a little bit uh, third. So on the left, I'm plotting uh, the herbivore reproduction rate as a function of, of the herbivore size, the consumer size, okay? Um, when I say consumer, I mean the herbivore, so the, the primary consumer in this case. And, and, if, and, and this is the same reproduction rate that I plotted before. It's, it's declining over, over body mass because uh, larger organisms reproduce slower. Um, and if we look at the uh, life history mortality rate, it's, it's very, very low. Uh, now this is the cohort, initial cohort mortality plus the act actuarial mortality. Uh, it's a couple of order of magnitudes larger and the difference between the reproduction rate is increasing with body size. And this kind of makes sense. Uh, because these are natural populations that evolved, uh, their mortality rate shouldn't be above their reproduction rate. Uh, that would be a problem um, for these evolving populations. Uh, so, so we would expect that, they, that their life history mortality rate would be lower so that the populations could exist. <laughs> um, if we consider the effects of harvesting, now instead of rates, I'm actually showing the steady state densities instead. So these are the steady state densities of the nutritional state structured model. And purple is the steady state densities of, of the full state or of the, the, the total state because the full state is essentially that plus the starvation state uh, with harvesting mortality applied. Now, in this case, we're assuming that harvesting mortality is mass independent. So if we look back over here on, these, on this rate plot, we can imagine harvesting as a straight line because it's not changing with, with body size of, of, the, of the consumer. Um, and at some point that straight line is going to intersect the reproduction rate and it's always going to do so first um, at the larger body sizes. And that results in this sharp decline towards zero, which would imply that those consumers uh, those larger consumers would be more negatively affected to the point where their populations would crash by a smaller amount of mass independent harvesting. Um, so that has some interesting implications for the effect of, you know, some subsidized predator on, on herbivores. It suggests that the larger herbivores should be much more fragile uh, to those effects than smaller herbivores. Um, there's more interesting ways to look at it than just a straight line. Um, and that's one of the things that we're investigating right now. If we, if we think about harvesting a little more deeply, we can, we can justify um, some of the relationships with consumer mass a little bit better, but a straight line is kind of a, a nice place to start. Um, but really I wanna focus on predation because when we look at predation, um, we have to take, predation is really complex when you, especially when you try to parameterize it in this way. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about um, the effect a predator population would have on different sized consumer populations. One of the important assumptions is that uh, a consumer of a given size is going to have a predator of a given size. Um, and so we're using the relationships observed for natural systems. So how predator size scales with um, the size of their prey uh, so that we can build an expectation for how predation rates change as a function of the prey size. So that means we're always assuming a predator that's scaled in a way that we observe in natural systems in terms of their sizes. 
when we do that and we account for all of the differences between what a predator um, is doing to a consumer population in terms of extracting resources and, and putting them into a predator population and building uh, predators out of those consumer resources, we observe a mortality rate that's actually uh, increasing as a function of consumer mass. And if it's increasing, that means, of course, that it, at some point it's going to intersect uh, the reproduction rate. And it's at this point of intersection that we would assume that sizes above this, this point are no longer feasible because this essentially means that the predator is withdrawing too much herbivore biomass to sustain that pairwise interaction. In other words, a, a predator that's large enough to prey on these large consumers need too much resources to sustain their populations, resulting in the crash of the herbivore population. So in other words, uh, we could say that this point is the maximum herbivore size that can support predator-induced mortality. So it's really a, a stability threshold. It's saying uh, interactions above that point are unstable and will result in a cascade effect where the herbivore population will crash and, and, and the predator population will crash as well, um, unless it's able to switch to a different food source. And we don't have that kind of complexity, that switching complexity in this built into this perspective. This is a very kind of simplistic um, uh, mean field perspective. But the point at which these intersect um, is, is interesting because it's, it's around 1,060 kilograms. And I noted before, and I showed this figure to the left earlier that uh, Sinclair noted in the Serengeti, um, above giraffe size, and certainly by the time you get to rhinoceros size, you've effectively escaped predation. And that also occurs between 800 and 1200 kilograms. So that threshold at which predators no longer have an influence on their on potential herbivore, on potential prey, uh, corresponds to the point that we predict where the predation mortality rate crosses that, that uh, reproduction rate. And I also mentioned that a given prey of a certain size corresponds to a predator of a certain size. And that we're taking those that ratio, that relationship, from modern systems. So we can twist this around. We can turn this question around and ask, what predator size does this prey threshold correspond to? And it turns out that the prey size that this corresponds to is about 802 kilograms, okay? So when we take that 1,060 kilograms and ask what size predator would be needed to take down a prey of that size, uh, based on modern relationships between predators and prey on in terrestrial systems, that predator would have to be about 800 kilograms. And if we look into the fossil record, 800 kilograms is an important number. Uh, it's the size of the largest observed terrestrial carnivores that we've observed throughout the Cenozoic. Um, we look at some of the classic ones like the saber tooth uh, cat, and that's ranges between 400 and 600 kilograms. There was a skull that was unearthed recently where they think they, it might have been up to 900 kilograms. So perhaps uh, some individuals might have gotten quite large. Uh, but the other uh, largest uh, carnivore, um, well, there's really two. So one is Andrew Sarkis, and that's kind of the most famous one. That's actually known just from a, a portion of a single skull. It's estimated be, to be between 800 and 1,000 kilograms. Uh, so on the low end, it overlaps with our expectation. Uh, the other one has the absolute best name of any organism in the fossil record, and it's called Sarcastodon, uh, and it's estimated to be about 800 kilograms. So um, we think with this perspective, we can, we're, we're predicting the maximum uh, carnivore size. Now, this has been done before by Chris Carbone in, in 2007 and 2010, uh, but he went about it using a very different approach where they were using uh, hunting and resting energetics to find this threshold where it's no longer feasible uh, for, for predators to take down prey. So this is really thinking about the feasibility from a predator perspective. Um, we're finding the same threshold, but thinking about it from the prey's perspective, uh, where there's an instability criterion that emerges because the predator population is pushing the prey down too far. Okay, um, I've got a few minutes and I, I just maybe maybe very briefly um, mention this other project that's that's related to these previous two and then I'll and then I'll shut up. Um, and that's really uh, asking this question of how do individuals balance starvation risk against reproductive investment 
when resource acquisition is uncertain and what are the evolutionary consequences? So this really was taking into account the fact that resources are not, um, you know, previously we were assuming that we were just using these mean field relationships, but of course resources vary in complicated ways across the landscape and that can impact starvation dynamics. Uh, we can have resources that are really even, evenly distributed like grasses to resources that are really patchily distributed like browse or, or prey. Prey are patchily distributed chunks of energy on the landscape that move. Um, and the patchiness can be really complicated. It depends on the type of resource, as I mentioned, but it also depends on the consumer, on the consumer's body size and how that body size varies with uh, area. So for example, if we take a single landscape like the Serengeti, like a grassland to an elephant, it looks very even and somewhat boring up until you know the, the hills anyway. But if we take that same landscape and look at a savanna mouse, it looks very patchy, it looks very different. And we can capture that type of variability and how it scales with body size with, with actually a single parameter. And we're calling that parameter zeta. Um, this is kind of a, a spatial version of Taylor's law. Um, if you're familiar with Taylor's law and thinking about how time series, um, the variability in time series data. Um, so this is the spatial version of that. And, and it really varies between, zeta varies between one and two. When zeta is one, uh, this is, corresponds to the example that I showed you on the previous slide where a mouse sees a patchy landscape, but as you increase the body size of the consumer, the, the resources become more even. In other words, the covariation of those resources declines. But on the other end, if zeta is equal to two, the patchiness is maintained as body sizes increase. So the savanna mouse sees a patchy landscape, but then as you increase in body size of the consumer, the patchiness is retained. And that would be more appropriate for predators, for instance, that are, that are looking for these discrete patches of their, their resources. Uh, and then a woodland then, or a browse landscape would be somewhere in between. Um, where the patchiness diminishes a little bit as you get larger, but not, not completely. So this project was really driven by my um, uh, postdoc, Utam Bhatt, who is now at, uh, in, in the NIMPS lab next to UC Santa Cruz working with Steve Munch, but he built a model that's based on stochastic processes that's very similar in some ways, in some respects, to the mean field uh, starvation model that, that I showed you before. And very simply, and not to spend too much time on this, but we imagine an individual's energetic stores as being the stochastic process. And that's what's uh, being shown in, in this graphic. So when they find food, they increase in energetic capacity, and then they decrease in energetic comp capacity as they burn their food. Okay, so, and, and the, res the resource landscape is somewhat stochastic. So sometimes they increase a lot in their energetic load. And then sometimes they, in, they increase just a little bit. And that depends on the, the variability and um, the, the mean, the availability of the, of the resources. Now, the other interesting component of this model is when they hit some established reproductive threshold, uh, we assume they reproduce. So when they become energetically replete enough, then they offload a bunch of energy that they're storing into their offspring. And so they diminish down to a lower threshold. So it's kind of risky to reproduce because it lowers how much energy you have. We can imagine this process is integrated over time for organisms that care for their offspring or, uh, or pregnant for a period of time. Here, it's just instantaneous in the model. And they offload this amount of energy into some number of offspring that's given by L. Okay, so they have a litter size and each individual gets some amount of energy and that's the energy that they start with. So if they have too many individuals in their litter, then the energy that they're offloading into that litter is um, distributed in each of those individuals and those individuals are starting pretty close to zero then and that might um, uh, have a negative impact on how long they survive and whether they survive to reproduce or not. So we think it captures some, some pretty important dynamics in terms of of this energetic trade-off between acquiring energy and then offloading it into your offspring. And there's a lot of things that we, we do with this. Um, this was published in 2020. Uh, we could treat this as, a, as an open optimization problem and just look at all of these different life history parameters and see which ones maximize uh, consumer fitness. And, and that's kind of a part of the paper. But the part that I wanted to focus on was to assume that life history traits follow expectations from allometric relationships 
So these are known allometric relationships and then numerically solve for population steady states. And what we find without going into the nasty details is that patchiness has a huge influence on the types of dynamics that we observe in, these, in, in this model. So just moving from a, a non-patchy to a patchy landscape. So when zeta is equal to one, we have a more evenly uh, distributed landscape, especially as you get larger. And when zeta is greater than one, we have a patchier landscape. Now, when the resource landscape is even, we have the type of dynamic that's represented by the red line in the graph below. Now, this graph below is we have the change in population size on the y-axis as a function of population size on the x-axis. Uh, if it's below zero, if the line is below zero, that means there's a decline in the population. And if the uh, line is above zero, it means there's increase in the population. So we see when in Apache landscape, we generally have an increase in the population over, over time uh, up to a certain population size above which we have a decrease in the population over time. So this is kind of like your classic, um, it goes up to a carrying capacity and then stays there. So this is a stable population. Uh, steady state. Okay. Now the slope of how this line intersects this point is really important because that tells us, you know, these are this is a stochastic system, so it's bouncing around, it's oscillating, and the slope gives us a sense of the size of the oscillations. If it's a really sharp slope, those oscillations are small, but if it's a really shallow slope, those oscillations can be really large and bad. Now, in Apache system, we get a very different type of dynamic. We have one that is in this negative dn over dt space, okay, and then it crosses this crosses the zero line and then increases and then crosses the uh, the line again. So, in this region, the dynamics are the same. There's a stable, there's a single stable steady state. But if the system gets pushed below this point, by uh, noted by the open circle then the population becomes doomed to extinction. And this is a classic Ali effect, okay? So um, you, we can imagine that if this line intercepts really uh, shallowly, um, that means oscillations are bigger. And you can imagine an oscillation that would push you below this threshold condition, and then you're, you're doomed to extinction, okay? So these are the types of dynamics that patchy resource landscapes promote Ali effects and promote and, and Ali effects can, can have these hidden uh, thresholds uh, that doom populations to extinction. So, so patchier resource landscapes are a little riskier for, for consumers. Now thinking about that lambda, uh, in other words, the slope in which that line intersects the, the zero um, population change line, um, that's, that's a measure of stability that corresponds in a nonlinear dynamic system to an eigenvalue, to the leading eigenvalue of the system, how much it bounces around. And we can actually uh, solve for this uh, stability um, criterion uh, as a function of the body mass of the consumer and how patchy the landscape is, uh, because those are all the components of the model. So here we have um, blue, the color blue is more stable and the color red is less stable. So the color red means that the slope is really shallow and the, the blue is the slope is really steep, so fewer oscillations. And what we observe, and so we can think of this as, as a fitness landscape um, that is a function of the body size of the consumer and how clustered the resources are. And what we observe is as we increase in body mass of the consumer, we have more stability. Larger bodied organisms um, can deal with uh, the, the stress of a resource landscape uh, better, in part because of the uh, super linear um, fat mass that they can store in their bodies and they can, they can withstand oscillations a little bit better. And another um, interesting message from this is that uh, the largest consumers have a, a higher uh, fitness, so, so more stable populations, even when the resource is very patchy whereas small consumers really have a hard time dealing uh, with patchiness. But we can think, because we can think of this as a resource, or sorry, as a fitness landscape, we can imagine trajectories moving along the space uh, where Cope's rule would tell us that our trajectories would be moving towards larger body masses. Um, and that's kind of what this fitness landscape predicts. So really, really briefly here, I just, I'll, I'll kind of finish on this um, and, and show you the results, but we wanted to take that 
predicted fitness landscape that's purely a function of the model and, and see if we could ask if we could address any paleoecological questions with it. And the one that we really wanted to ask is, does this tell us anything about the origin of grazers uh, during the Miocene? Because we have this switch from a resource landscape, sorry, a, a resource landscape that's patchier and woodier to a resource landscape that's more open and even and grassy. Um, and we know that uh, herbivores responded to this by evolving to become grazers and also evolving larger body sizes. So can we make any inference with that fitness landscape that we put together on those paleo populations and paleo um, evolutionary uh, trajectories? And our problem is we can, we can reconstruct the body sizes of consumers, but how do we reconstruct the, the uh, patchiness of the resource landscape? Well, we could potentially do that by looking at stable isotope ratios because browsers have low Delta C13 values. Um, and so we can equate browse with low delta C13 values and grazers, organisms that are eating grass, have high delta C13 values and we can equate grass with a zeta value of one. So if a 100% grazed diet corresponds to a grassland with a zeta of, value, zeta of one, what does a 100% browse diet correspond to in terms of a, a value for zeta? Well, we can go to Google Earth and take snapshots of places like the Serengeti or other wooded landscapes, um, actually not the Serengeti, but more wooded than the Serengeti, um, and extract a value of zeta uh, by using a, bo a box counting algorithm. And so if we look at that resource landscape and ignore all the details, we just focus on where the trees are, where the resources are, 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 uh, are patchy, uh, we get an average uh, zeta of about 1.71, okay? So that's not quite two, but it's in between one and two. So if we assume, if we linearly interpolate between the delta C13 values of these extinct organisms and use that as our measure of zeta, so where we have a 100% grazer having a zeta of one and a 100% browser having a zeta of 1.7, then we can actually take these ancient organisms and plot them on our fitness landscape um, because we know their body mass is on the y-axis and we have a reconstruction for their zeta value on the x-axis. And when we do this, right here I'm plotting uh, mostly from, from Africa, but also some organisms from North America, the color denotes the time that they are coming from, okay, from zero up to 10 million years before present. We observe these trajectories that begin to be laid out on this fitness landscape. Uh, so suids, equids, rhinos, they're all moving kind of towards the lower right to the upper left of this fitness landscape. And that's what the fitness landscape would predict. As we get larger though, the pattern becomes a little harder to observe. For example, once we get to elephantids and um, there's not really a whole lot of that upwards movement. Uh, dinotheres and giraffids don't follow it at all. Um, and that's also what we would predict because that fitness landscape becomes a lot more shallow as we get larger because larger organisms can deal with patchy foods better. Okay, I didn't think I'd get all through that, but um, that is, that's it. Um, so the highlights then just to review is that uh, the dynamics of starvation recovery predict Damas law and provide a selective mechanism for the origin of Cope's rule. That's our argument anyway. Uh, consumer predation mortality rates predict the maximum body size for terrestrial mammalian predators, we think. Uh, and finally, accounting for resource patchiness and the energetic trade-offs of foraging and, reproduct and reproduction provides a selective mechanism for the evolution of grazing. So with that, I'd like to thank my uh, collaborators. And if there's time for questions, happy to, happy to do my best. Thank you so much, Justin, for this wonderful talk. Uh, it was fantastic. A lot of things to think, uh, and and I will go back in the talk in in the in your talk later to 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 follow all the details. But it was impressive. It was really impressive. So I have questions, Lucas? Can you make the first question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Awesome work that you do. So uh, I was wondering during the presentation about the uh, copies rule and if it is rule is also found in insects and yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. So it's obvious in terrestrial mammals, they found it in marine systems across taxa. I have, 
I am not aware. Maybe Matias would know. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, <laughs> of wh whether it's been it's been found for for insects. That's a really interesting question. Yeah, but you know well, that the, the I have no idea. But yeah, <laughs> I would say that the thinking about the carboniferous and the Cretaceous large bugs, then uh, it's more about the atmospheric content of O2 and things like that. So you don't have clear trends like in mammals. I haven't read enough about it. Yeah, Ma Matthew Clapham has done some work on evolution of body size in, in um, arthropods. And I think he found a pretty big signal around the evolution of uh, pterosaurs. So there was a, there was, I, I seem to remember something like that. Like there was um, a big signal when pterosaurs evolve uh, you can see a, a change in the body size evolution of, of a lot of insects. Great. And a lot of that data is in the paleobiology database too, the body size data, you know, based on wing size metrics and things like that. Cool, cool. Uh, I also uh, was wondering on a second question is about, uh, you're referring to the body size of carnivores, right? Uh, it seems to be this positive relationship uh, increasing through time. And you measure that you uh, usually measure the body, the body mass of the carnivores by the individual, right? So I was, the, I was thinking that these make a lot of sense if you are considering solitary species, but if you are considering like social species, like wolves, should you consider the size, the body mass of the hunting group? So that's, that's a really good point and that's kind of built in so the way that we're estimating the optimum body mass for a predator given the body mass of its prey is using um, that same uh, phenomenological model that uh, Machias has used a bunch uh, from Roar where they take a community and use you know build an adjacency matrix from the interactions in that community and then build a probability of a link existing between predators and prey based on body size ratios. You can solve that model for the, the peak of that, um, of those relationships. So if you take the derivative of that estimate and then solve for, you know, where it equals zero, you can solve for the, the peak. And that's kind of the optimum um, body size of a, of a predator for a given prey. So if, if that adjacency matrix is influenced by social interactions, which, which it is for the, the Serengeti, then, then that's part of what emerges. Um, and if the adjacency matrix is full of solitary predators, then, then you wouldn't have that influence. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Just, uh, just following up on this question. So uh, it appears to me that the body size of uh, social carnivores are uh, smaller compared to the solitary carnivores. I don't know if that's true or not. It's just like uh, my impression about the topic. Is there, uh, but during your, your whole presentation, you're saying that there is an advantage of having large body size of carnivores. So what would be the advantage then on having small body sizes since like this social, this sociality appears to be reducing body sizes? Yeah, it's kind of like a super organism kind of effect, right? It's it's like uh, you can hit above your weight if you're if you are uh, if you're social. So if you so is your question like what would happen if we assumed then that the organisms were not social? Like what how how that, how that would influence the relationship? No, uh, you made the argument that it is is good to have large body size, but social species seems to be the opposite. They are decreasing the body size. So I was wondering, what would be the advantage of having low body size? Oh, as a, as a carnivore. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, there might be a, a few. Um, one is if you're foraging as a group, you've also got to share your resources that you take down. And if you're larger, you're going to need more. Um, so you would have to be hunting larger organisms to, to to have that egalitarian uh, response. Um, and 
there's a limit to that, at least we predict, um, where you can only hunt organisms uh, so, so large. Um, so that might be one, but I haven't really thought really carefully about that problem. So there's probably many others um, that constraints that would feed into that. Thanks so much. Yeah. Fantastic. Paulina? If we have time, I have two questions, but if not, just like mm -hmm. one. I, th I thought it was very interesting when you were bringing the feasibility from the prey's perspective and from the predator's perspective. And so what I was wondering is, we have observed communities beyond this predator and prey feasibility perspective, right? So do you have any hints or ideas on which side would like actually like what, what would drive the um, extinction of either like the prey, the big prey or the big predators, which one comes first? Maybe it's a chicken and egg problem, but we've seen communities beyond the feasibility threshold for both prey and predators. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good question. So I guess, so right now, what we have is kind of like a static picture. Um, we, in other words, we're not really encoding dynamics for the predator. We're just looking at like, imagine a constant suck from a predator population. How would that influence the prey? I think that to address your question, you'd have to really build in a full dynamics for the predator. Um, and then also the other, and, and so we've, we've been playing around with that. We haven't done it yet, but um, one other interesting dynamic that would influence these relationships is um, the adaptive response of the predator. Um, in other words, when it's influencing its larger prey negatively, um, it might ratchet down uh, its, its prey classes that it's focused, that it's consuming from. Um, and that might also push out smaller predators that can't compete with the larger predators until, until a region where there's kind of an energetic limitation. Um, and so we, we actually have a model that incorporates that ratcheting dynamic. And we wanted to see like, oh, you know, imagine humans competing for mammoths now, and they're forcing all of these other predators to ratchet down um, what that means for the smaller timescales of, of uh, the, 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 the prey um, or the prey community, really. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think a lot of these things have to incorporate like adaptive responses that we totally gloss over in this in this version. And then if if if, if the question is about like, well, we observe larger prey predator relationships because dinosaurs and all of these other non-mammalian interactions. Um, I mean, ultimately, it would be fun to to tune this to dinosaurs. <laughs> that's that's always kind of been the the ultimate goal for me but um we would have to reparameterize all of the metabolic relationships because this model is really built from the ground up in terms of the energetics um so we would have to populate it with with dinosaur energetics which which we would have to guess at but we could guess is it very like do you think it's very different from the mammalian perspective i think so yeah i mean um best guess um from well, I mean, from uh, looking at uh, ontogenetic growth curves reconstructed from the fossil record, um, theropods anyway were were certainly mesotherms, um, and well, well, some a lot of the theropods, sorry, were, were endotherms, but then a lot of the other dinosaurs, the prey, were probably mesotherms. Um, and then I, when you get really big, you get things get strange. You, you get this gigantothermy. You don't even need metabolism. <laughs> You're just, you know producing all of this heat in your gut, maybe the problem would be to get rid of heat. But um, yeah, you get into really weird uh, metabolic relationships that I haven't thought too carefully about, but you could definitely, you could definitely bound it, you know? Yeah, and if there's time, there's another one, but it's from the balance starvation risk and the reproductive investment. It's more of a, cu a curiosity when you were talking about like the optimization to consumer fitness, so you optimize the parameters to uh, like the best consumer fitness. And is that fitness just defined as offspring in this case? Or how like how is the parameters 
uh, tune, tune for that optimization. So in that one, we were, when we built the fitness landscape, we were assuming strict allometric relationships for all of those parameters. So we weren't optimizing for that. Um, uh, we were um, measuring just what the stability was by that, by that slope near, near dn over dt equals zero. Um, and that was our, our stability. So we weren't optimizing that to find the fitness landscape. We were just measuring the effect of, of the resource patchiness on the slope directly. Um, and the, we do have an optimization part of that paper um, where we do maximize um, surviving individuals. So, so it's a full fitness measure of, of both survival and uh, uh, population and, and the number of individuals or the number of offsprings that, that survive uh, among individuals. Cool, I'll take that paper out. Thank you. No problem. Matthias. Hey, Jesse. Good hey. to see you. Yeah, good to um, see you too. I'm sorry I missed the, the pre-talk chat session. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you were talking here before and then I got you already starting, so I missed it. No worries. Uh, yeah, so uh, a very, very cool talk and uh, I'm always intrigued by the, the, the way you see foraging and evolution and you mix that up and make some crazy papers. It's amazing. <laughs> so thanks for showing these ideas for us. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. And uh, so about the second, uh, I, I was wondering about the second paper that what, what you showed there is that in some sense, there is some kind of uh, ecological limit to the, to the ecological upper size limit for predators, right? And, and this would be, uh, this could be a driver for uh, pre predator size evolution over time. Yeah. And um, I was wondering if you have already tested or planning to do it, uh, <coughs> how just this uh, upper size limit changed over time or how uh, it changes after some like events of uh, extinction or prey size uh, reduction? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, it, we have not yet thought about that. And I guess the way that I would approach it, and that's a really good, um, that would be a really good thing to look at. Uh, the way that I would approach it, and this is, this is something else. So, so where that, that size threshold is where that rate, the mortality rate, predation mortality rate intersects the reproduction rate. There's a few things that that is really sensitive to, um, like the energy density. Um, and so, and the energy density scales allometrically. So right now we're using like energy density, uh, you know, the allometric scaling of fat and muscle and non-skeletal elements uh, to essentially derive the average energy density for a consumer of a given size. That has a lot of influence. Um, but another thing that's gonna have a lot of influence is that optimum predator size for a given prey and that we're getting from the roar model. And that's something that's entirely phenomenological. So it's kind of like not really based on, on the energetics um, as, as we have them encoded anyway. Uh, and you would imagine if you went back in time to the Miocene, to the Oligocene, to the Eocene or whatever, um, you would get very different um, relationships uh, for what the max or what the optimum predator size for a given prey is um, as a function of the interactions in that particular system. Um, and, but that's, that's, that's something that you could tweak. That's something that you could explore. Uh, so, so you could essentially ask the reverse question, what type of community would result, what, what type of community interactions could give you the size threshold that we observe? And, and that is something I, I didn't think about until you asked this question and uh, we should do that. 
Yeah, I actually have two other ideas for future work, and yeah. <laughs> so yeah. one one would be to to test uh, whether there were particular events that made uh, a huge shift in this maximum, like in this upper body size of predators. Like, can we identify moments in history where we had a a, a shift because of the shift in the community and the assemblage of of potential prey? There is a shift in the in the size of the potential predators. And another one would be uh, to look that into, uh, to project that into space. So if we look now, uh, we have all these kinds of, all these different places where uh, we are losing the largest, uh, the largest herbivores. So how does this create a mosaic of potential predator size for the future? So probably there are places where some types of large predators will, will may not be able to exist in the future. So a, a new type of spatial patterns of future body size of predators might be emerging. And maybe this model is cool to capture that. Yeah. That's that's a really interesting idea. Um, and I I think there's enough play in the, uh, some of the parameters, I, I'm gonna send you this predation thing that we worked up um, and, and, and see if you buy it. But uh, I think there, there's definitely enough play in some of those parameters to kind of explore where what pushes that intersection around. Um, and and I, think, I think what you just explained is kind of like the reverse of that. Like given, given different constraints or given different uh, patterns of, of extinction or limits on, on a system, what, um, how does that tell us about where that, where that line might intersect? And, and if you know the play of the parameters, if you know the sensitivities, um, then you could have a set of hypotheses for given this, given this pattern, um, it's either due to this change in this parameter or this change to this parameter, because that pushes the intersect around in particular ways that's that's really cool i i really like that idea let's do it okay <laughs> oh, let, let me let me add an, another idea i was wondering if depending on the type of ecological interaction that that uh support a given uh, a given consumer the evolutionary dynamics of those interactions will will lead these species to move in this in the parameter space in different ways. Uh, if you are like if you assume that like in an antagonistic interaction, like a plant herbivore interactions, uh, maybe selection is favoring uh, uh, the reduce of the intake of the herbivore. So the defenses of plants are are actually trying to uh impure the 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 resource intake of the consumer whereas in other situations the 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 resources are, are is actually packing energy in a very easy edible way for for the consumer as in like in frugivore uh, uh plant interactions so and this this may not change the the, the physiological constraints limiting the system, but will change the way the this pairwise interaction will move in in the in the trade space through time in an evolutionary uh, model, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would also really influence like the patchiness of that food of those foods because that's really interesting, and I think that points to one of the big challenges. I think because you know, we think of a resource landscape, but, you know, you could say, you could point to a resource landscape, and it's, but but I can't like eat tree trunks, you know, and there's a lot of in that resource landscape that's not available to me. And like you were saying with like secondary metabolites and or, or compounds, um, there's a lot of unavailability um, packed into those resources. So it would be really interesting to think about how those things would produce patchiness, even if the patchiness of the visual patchiness isn't really changing. Yeah, this, this will be very interesting to explore. 
uh, uh, I have one last comment about Lucas Lucas' idea uh, of the very interesting idea about uh, sociality favored is small small, small um, body sizes, but. Uh, I was I was thinking, and many of our examples of social predators are actually pretty large animals. So it's as almost if they are circumventing the problem uh, of of taking down large, extremely large organisms by joint forces. So uh, I, I'm I'm not sure if the selection favor is smaller. Uh, body size in this in this large predator like gray wolves uh, like timber wolves and, and lions are pretty big compared to their close relate, re relatives actually so and, and the same is true for other social predators so this this would be interesting uh, because to combine many individuals definitely is not energy in, in, in energetic point of view is not uh, the same of build up a, a single Godzilla-like predator, isn't it? It's, it's much less effective because you need to keep many bodies, small body, body sizes moving around. So what 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 are, so what are the selective pressures that are actually favoring, and how they relate to the constraints you show us today? This would be very interesting to pursue. I mean, as a scientific aim. Yeah, so, yeah, because there you might there might be some like surprising relationships there because of the metabolic scalings. Because a lot of these come out, a lot of these things come out by thinking about like by comparing these these different scaling slopes together. By adding the different slopes together, you're getting you know weird slopes that come out. And thinking about a single organism and its allometric kind of energetic properties versus multiple organisms energetic properties like what is the metabolic perspective of a super organism versus a single organism there might be some really weird stuff in there that that sounds yeah, really how, interesting yeah how you move to a uh, a pride of lionesses to something bigger or smaller isn't it like how how, how this combine with uh, the relates to the 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 scaling laws that we know for uh, individual organisms. This, yeah, this, this, this would be cool. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. Oh, and there are other social organisms that usually hunt together. I know sh chimpanzees and humans, I think. <laughs> Ants, right? Ants are definitely a single organism. <laughs> But has anybody ever investigated that from like a, a metabolic perspective? Like what is the what is the I'm metabolism sure. of an ant colony um, versus the metabolism as of an ant? No, I know that I, I don't know nothing about that uh, specifically. I know about foraging in, in, in army ants. They did a lot of work on how they deplete resources and move from different areas. There is a lot of theoretical work, like because this is one of these amazing examples of complex uh, complex pattern emerging for, from simple rules. So how the army ant explore and deplete resource, but- I bet sure, it's way more efficient. Like yeah. if you had a colony of ants that is cooperating compared to the same size group of individuals doing their own thing, I bet the colony is way more efficient. I bet it's an efficiency thing. So maybe a key parameter is, is the coordination uh, 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 of strategies among the elements of the system, isn't it? Like if you have uh, like 10,000 bugs trying to feed, to prey upon uh, beetles and spiders around, this will be a messy. But if you do a coordinated movement and you explore resources as in a fungus-like way, that's the way army ants do, they just branch and then branch and branch like like a fungi exploring like fungi exploring um, rot food uh, this much be very much more efficient as, as you said and this may be translating a kind of a cooperative parameter so maybe maybe cooperation is enough to surpass the costs of having individual unities that that you need to maintain but this is just brainstorming yeah? 
<laughs> well, so so that's funny because we so just yesterday in my in a class uh, a grad class that I'm I'm teaching we just read the paper by Martin Nowak you know that that infamous 2010 paper in uh, Nature that everybody hated and it is terrible it's a terrible paper uh, the first half of it is terrible but the second half is a really cool model that they don't really talk about because they're too focused on being terrible. Um, and, and but but if you look at the model that that a model that that they present in a supplement of their paper because they don't talk about it in the paper um, would be a good one to to explore that idea if you parameterize it me metabolically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We need to to set a meeting to discuss these ideas and, and to and and combine that with the dinosaur paper. And of course, with the Justice League paper that we keep keep on hold. <laughs> I feel like my to-do list is getting longer after after this uh, talk. <laughs> yeah, I missed out those times in California that the that, that, that to-do list increases every week, every meeting, and some really cool things show up after that. And and, and I think that your talk illustrates a. Uh, very well that Justin. I mean, as Matias said, you combine ideas in a very unique way. And well, I really like to read, no matter if scientific papers, comics, or books, uh, of people that by combining things in different ways led me to keep thinking, thinking and digesting the ideas for a while. And, and you are for sure one of my favorite writers. <laughs> Thanks, Paolo. <laughs> Vice versa. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Justin, for taking your time and give us this talk. Uh, and so that's it. Have a good afternoon for everybody. And this is Marina saying <laughs> goodbye. Bye -bye. <laughs> I see you guys. Great to see you guys. Yep. Bye, everyone. So here. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure, my friend. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>